Okay. Welcome everyone to the second half of our lunchtime Congress Live climate change panel. After our um, Spanish language discussion, we are now going over the challenges the movement faces around climate change in English. Um, we're discussing the global union movement's response to the long -term, longest term threat to jobs on the planet, climate change. Joining us today, the former Mandela minister and social global social activist, Jane Idu. We have Merlin Van Moore from the United Nations Environment Program and the Industrials uh, Director of Sustainability, Brian Kohler. Welcome to you all. Look, I want to start by talking about the elephant in the room, which is despite the warnings of scientists that urgent action is needed to prevent catastrophic climate change, the world really isn't doing much at all. Um, in short, are we on the pathway to self-destruction? Is it too late to do anything about it, Merlin? Um, no, it's absolutely not too late. I do think that we have, since the last IPCC report, which was in 2007, and four years or five years later this year, the fifth IPCC report, it's clear that we have lost an incredible amount of time. It doesn't mean that it is too late. It simply means that uh, the global community is going to have to take very swift action and very deep emission reductions will be required by at least 2030, according to the latest science. So my opinion is that it's not too late. We're not in an apocalyptic scenario. But have you seen anything to suggest to you that swift action is in any way possible? Yes, I think that we certainly, as the United Nations Environment Program, we have seen positive signals. Some of those signals, and many um, people are not aware of it, but at the national level, at least since 2007 up until the current year, so that's over a six-year period, we have seen an increase in national domestic climate legislation. Now, to the extent that those policies and incentive systems are actually implemented, that is another question. But the fact that you have seen an almost double-fold increase over just six years suggests that some governments, clearly 66 countries over five years is not a smaller number, that they are doing something. So I think that there is a positive signal that suggests there's some movement. But as I say, whether that's going to realize or translate into practical actions remains to be seen. Jay, you've spent a lot of your life working for change, and change by its nature takes momentum. When it comes, it can move very swiftly. Do you have hope that we are moving to a point where rapid change is possible? Frankly, no. I, I, I think climate change is moving at the rate of a sprint, and we're close to the edge of a precipice, and our political leadership in the world is running a marathon. So all the evidence is pointing to a above two degree rise in temperature. And there doesn't seem to be any political world that I see uh, that is prepared to stop it. And so, you know, in the work that I'm doing and chairing a foundation dealing with malnutrition and hunger in the world, I see growing hunger. You know, when I go and visit communities around Lake Turkana or in parts of Africa or Asia, in Bangladesh, I, I'm seeing incredible millions of people at risk already. In Turkana, there are wars starting over water and over grazing land. In the whole of the, you know, whole of uh, the Horn of Africa can be linked directly to its, the impact of climate change in causing wars that we are seeing today, and that's starting across the rest of Africa. We know for, as a fact that the climate change and one degree rise in temperature is going to plummet the agricultural real, yields of staple foods. We know it's going to cause dramatic increases in food prices of basic staple foods. And yet, we know that the population is going to double in Africa. So I, I, I frankly do not see the political will in the world today in the countries that are causing the problem, in the developed world, to take action to stop, change the way they live, change their lifestyles, and reduce the carbon emissions. So we are at risk because of things that we have no responsibility for. Brian, you um, representing workers in industrial industries worldwide, 
would know that the short-term fear of change is a real resistance to action. Uh, is it an insurmountable barrier, in your opinion? Sustainability is defined as looking after the social, environmental and economic imperatives simultaneously, and that's really the key to getting past the fear that you've mentioned. There are no jobs on a dead planet. We know this. That's clear. However, if you want workers and their unions to make radical changes to what they're doing today, you must be able to tell them what they will be doing tomorrow. And it had better sound good to them, not just to the Waltons and the Koch brothers. It has to sound good to workers, and that is the concept we call a just transition. So just transition is the key that unlocks the door to a sustainable future. And the sequence is important. Society has to get its head around this concept of a just transition and really construct how they're going to deliver it. And then the fear of making radical changes will be largely eradicated and we will be able to make rapid progress that's needed. Merlin, this notion of just transition um, is something that's emerged from civil society. Is that something that the UN has been embracing and working towards and I guess placing some flesh on the bone around? Um, I think for most of us who have followed the evolution of um, the UN's framework convention on climate change is familiar with the fact that one of the first principles of the convention is about this notion of justice. And it is enshrined in the common language called common but differentiated um, responsibilities and respective capabilities. So within that particular principle, there is a recognition that in order to address climate change, you have to take into account notions of fairness and equity. However, I think the challenge going forward towards a new global climate agreement is the extent to which one operationalizes which those principles. And that has not happened clearly, which I think why your point is so crucially important and why the work done by the Mary Robinson Foundation, for example, has been extremely crucial and also the work that, um, that, that, that Jay has done. And I think that if the global community can understand this notion of intergenerational equity and what it means for future generations, so it means that you, instead of taking an immediate or short, short-term outlook, you take a longer-term outlook and enshrine hopefully within that this notion of um, uh, historical responsibility but also responsibility for, for future generation. And I think the issue of justice is also extremely linked um, to the issue of particularly women and so I think the issue of gender is an important um, principle that has to go alongside um, the issue of justice. And obviously women, particularly women in small or poorer communities. But so I think we still have a long way to go to make this principle, which is documented within the convention, how to translate that into um, reality. Uh, Jay, um, th th that challenge is, is very real and it you know, in a way, that notion of justice is potentially the glue that ties the union movement with broader NGOs. And obviously, your presence here at, at the Congress is is part of that that reaching out. Yeah, so absolutely. You know, I was the founding general secretary of Kusatu, you know, the largest trade union in the history of South Africa. And and and, and certainly, our struggle was about human dignity and and justice. And it still remains a. The, the mission that we have to accomplish in climate change. Because people in the slums and in the rural areas don't have refrigerators even. They don't know about carbon emissions. All they know is that the water supply is drying up, the grazing land is going, that food insecurity is rising at a household level, and that wars are starting and conflicts are starting. So I think we've got to reduce it to that. You know, if you look at change that has been fundamental in the world, whether it is workers' rights, whether it is a struggle for freedom in South Africa, it was based on the people being the engine of that change. It was organizing our people at a grassroots level in the townships, in the factories, in the mines. 
in the villages, in the, town, in, 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 in the schools. And I think that's what we keep forgetting. All the evidence from this Congress here is saying there is no shortage of money. In fact, the unions are sitting on close to $30 trillion of investment. The question that the Congress is asking is where's that money going to? Is it going into the real economy? Because I was the Minister of Communication in South Africa. At the time in the mid-90s when there were literally 600,000 cell phones in Africa, less than the island of Manhattan. But because we had the political will and we committed ourselves to an investment driven by the public sector to create the right regulations, the right policies, Today, the market is 800 million cell phones. Can we have the same political will? And the question that we have to ask, can we have the people, the organized labor, working with the other parts of civil society now, banging on the doors of those who are negotiating, who are today responding more to the pressure of the Koch brothers, of that 1%, that today the 85 people that control more wealth than half of humanity, three and a half billion, unless the unions take leadership on this issue and demand the type of jobs, I see tremendous jobs coming out of proper investment going into the green economy. But the unions have to lead the charge on this. One of the um, themes of the Congress is really the disconnect between the corporate power and the, and the agendas of the corporate um, sector and um, the agenda of, of working people, Brian, and to what extent do you observe your members and members of industrial affiliates being influenced by the, the scare campaigns being run by big mining and the, the big carbon polluters who just don't have any incentive to change in the short term? Well, you're referring to climate scepticism, so-called. Um, that's a difficult problem. I think it triumphs over science because of it's sort of an asymmetric warfare situation. Scientists do not realize that they're not debating other scientists. They're debating a right-wing noise machine. So as a scientist, you think that, oh, there's people out there that still don't believe the science. I'll publish another peer-reviewed paper. So they do, and they publish it, and the, doubt, the doubters get louder. And then they think, well, I'll publish another peer-reviewed paper. And they do, and the doubters get louder. It's because they're not debating scientists. They're debating a noise machine. And they have no interest in, in actually hearing the truth. Um, and in fact, the opposition wins by only creating doubt. It shouldn't be surprising to us that these powerful voices are waging a campaign of disinformation and job blackmail to prevent change. And this has nothing to do with science. That's what the scientists don't understand. It has nothing to do with science. It has everything to do with trillions of dollars of fossil fuel reserves whose value will be affected by any action plan that's adopted by the world. Likewise, and this is something we have to remind our members of, it has nothing to do with genuine concern for working people. The very voices that are raising themselves uh, in opposition to action right now are the same voices that have spent the last couple of decades or, more, or longer attacking working people and their unions. They're, it's completely false to believe that they are suddenly concerned about jobs that may be lost in these industries. What it is, it's a class war. It's a delaying action. While we delay, the billionaires will prepare safe havens for themselves and their money, and workers and poor people disproportionately will pay the cost of climate change. That is a fairly grim prognosis. Um, Merlin, has the UN formed a picture of the different impact on jobs of an early transition as opposed to a crisis-driven one if, if change is delayed? And, and what is that difference in scenarios for, um, for jobs both in the developed and the developing world? Yes, certainly from some of the early analysis that we've done, both uh, in specific countries, whether it's Spain or India or China or on a regional level, and this is in the context of a transition to a, re a green economy, so early transition. Um, I'll give an example. So in Spain in 2006, 
um, the government put into legislation building codes, which meant that new buildings had to meet certain um, standards or old buildings had to be refurbished. The data shows that since between 2006 and today, um, that particular industry, whether it is the solar panels or the manufact or manufacturing related to um, greening buildings, that particular industry managed to generate um, more than um, or close to 10,000 jobs. Now, that figure might seem small, but for that particular sector, it is actually quite significant. And some of we have similar data in countries such as India, where as well as in um, parts of the uh, European Union, where we are today, where we can show that um, the, uh, industries such as solar and wind, which probably was worth a few billion five years ago, has actually tripled. And I think that that is significant if you think about the fact that solar and wind as renewable sources of energy is still managing to generate jobs when it is in effect competing against a subsidized industry, which is fossil fuels, which has been there for a much longer time. It's not a young industry such as renewables. And so I think that kind of growth that we're seeing, both in terms of jobs there, it, it is significant. And we have to take some degree of, I, I think, a positive signal from that. It would be a brave government, however, that would take on the fossil fuel industry, <laughs> wouldn't it, Jay? Oh, in, in my country, yeah. Australia, the, the, the last Labor government tried to take them on and they, they lost the are no longer a government. <laughs> yes. No, I, I think absolutely. But what did the ITUC survey show of workers. There are very few workers or citizens who trust their governments because corporate power has captured elections. Look at the amount of money going into election campaigns and the lack of transparency about where that campaign finance is going. These are demands that are central to the workers' interests because we cannot trust governments today that are more serving the interests of corporate power who are maintaining us on a path to, to destruction. You know, there is no planet B we have. <coughs> but these know. are the governments that we elect. These are the governments we elect. And that's where one is saying the countervailing force to the power of corporates, particularly the 1%, is the power of organized citizens. And the most important of those organizations of citizens is the trade union movement. If you take just the statistics on this, take what Merle is saying, more than one and a half billion people don't have access to electricity. In India, it's 300 million people. Imagine if we had the political will of government, including those that sit as trustees of pension funds, to say, we will invest into solar energy. Imagine the jobs that will be created there. Imagine the jobs, we're not talking about replacing cars, we're talking about fuel efficient cars or cars that are hybrids or cars that are electric dri driven. This is about investment in innovation. If you look at these cell phones, how innovation is changing these devices every nine months. Why can't we have the same innovation in those industrial you know, production processes today that are today contributing to carbon emission increases. And so for us in the developing world, yes, we are saying we did not cause this problem. There is a historical obligation on the developed world to pay for the mitigation costs of this, to make the technology available to us so we don't have to go through the life cycle of old technology. We can go to the most advanced. That's what we did in, in, in mobile technology. We didn't go through analog from no communications infrastructure. We went to digital. In fact, we, we leapfrogged the developed world. And this is the things that the, cl the climate negotiations well has to address. And it's not going to address it. If you know collective bargaining, it's not going to be addressed if you do not have power. It is about building power, workers' power, citizen power, youth power, and acting in concert to say, our children are at risk, the human species is at risk, the planet is at risk, and we cannot afford the human greed of a minority, of a 1%, to prejudice the future of humanity. It has to be a political conversation. It's not a technical conversation. Do, do you agree that national governments may not be the solution to the change that is required 
Merlin, you, you, you work for the UN where your main point of reference is out through, through national governments. Is, is that part of the problem rather than part of the solution? I mean, all national governments have a role to play because they make um, decisions, important policy decisions, and governments have those tools to either regulate or tax so that fossil fuels stay in the ground. Now, as Jay says, that's a tool that you have as a national government. Whether you choose to use those tools depends on the extent to which your electorate can hold you accountable or push you in that direction. But I think the big challenge for national governments all around the world is that you, are, you have a short-term approach because your political term is four or five years, so therefore your policy decisions are within that narrow frame, time frame. Whereas if you're talking about setting a target for 2030, which is beyond, I think, most people's immediate grasp, let alone a politician's, that's where I believe the challenge comes in for um, holding political leaders accountable or even for them being willing to be bold enough to check, make policy choices that will long outlive their political um, ad administration. And the last issue, I think the tension is that um, addressing the climate action problem versus addressing, for example, food security. If there is a famine in a particular re region, we know that there's an Im you can see it, there's an immediate consequence, and if you do not take action, the consequences of no ac action are perceived as visible. Here, yeah, when governments, some governments decide to delay action, the immediate consequences are not as tangible and perhaps to that extent it may be harder to mobilize your, your, your citizens to um, get you to do the right thing. Could I just also ask you, um, at a national level, corporations interfere to frustrate action on climate change basically everywhere. Is that also happening at a global level through... Do, do you, are your programs resisted and interfered with in the same way? Um, I think for the United Nations, um, essentially because we have to work with civil society, um, and that is probably one of the greatest strengths of the, the UN's programs, is that you have to have that strong backing from civil society. So to the extent that there may be corporates who may want to influence or push things in a different direction, but if you have a strong base of support and involvement you can actually push back against, against that. Brian, this um, Congress will see unions sign a Unions for Climate pledge um, later this evening, committing all affiliates to driving the issue at a national level. What sort of issues do you see being driven as a result of this particular agreement? Well, number one for us is just transition. Um, that's, the, as I said earlier, the key that unlocks everything else. And what it addresses is the problem of fear that you mentioned and the problem of who benefits and who pays the price of adjustments demanded by society. Um, in the present system, basically any changes that eventually get adopted by the United Nations, the cost of those changes will be borne by ordinary people, not by the 1 percent, not by the billionaires, not by the corporates but by ordinary working people and poor people disproportionately. That is fundamentally unfair, that's fundamentally unjust, and it has to be addressed before people will accept it. Otherwise, they will cling with their last strength to their dirty, polluting, and harmful jobs, even harmful to themselves, but they haven't seen any alternative. That's what they will uh, demand to be protected. So, it's fine to assume that we can create a lot of jobs in the movement towards a greener economy, and I believe that we can, but where will those jobs be and who will get them? There needs to be a clear adjustment program so that not just new workers in these industries will benefit, but also existing workers in existing industries and the families and communities that rely on them will have a future mapped out for them that they can believe in. Um, you know, it's so difficult to, to answer your question. I mean, I could list off a range of issues from sustainable energy to 
uh, you know, the el reduction or elimination of toxic substances from the environment to uh, access to power and stability of price and all the things that go along with energy and, uh, and the climate. But the key, as I say, has got to be just transition, and it has to come first. The sequence is important. You can't say, well, we will make all of these changes in society and we'll, we'll get around to talking to you about a just transition later. No, that will not fly. The only way to make the changes that are so necessary right now is to design a just transition program first, up front, and make it real and make it believable. That's the only way. Is that something the UN has a framework for, Berlin? Um, not the UN as the UN, um, because as I said earlier, the, we are guided by the Convention's yeah. principles, and those principles were decided by parties or government. So to the extent that the principle of um, common but differentiated, the principle of equity, um, the right to development, all of those are there. Um, to the extent that those are there and that can guide s some of what Brian is talking about, so this notion of a, a just transition, which needs to be started now rather than mm. afterwards. I think that the, 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 the principles are there and the tools are there, but it will depend on to the extent to which citizens can drive their governments to, 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 to do that at the, at the global level. Jay, do you see it? The, the problem with the concept seems to be that it's hard for a worker whose job is about to go to hold on to and say, um, this is what my future is going to look like. But, you know, I, I struggle with that concept mm. because, you know, we are almost trying to say that the unions are disempowered. They're not disempowered. You're having a Congress here which represents 176 million organized workers. You are a powerful force. You sit on resources like pension funds of over $30 trillion. Why are you looking to someone else for your solutions? Why don't you implement the strategy of the just transition and drive that as an investment strategy and tell the fund managers who control your workers' funds that we want to see real jobs in the real economy and we want those to be low carbon jobs and we want them to be green jobs. Why are we handing power to the Koch brothers et al? And this is what I cannot understand. The struggle for freedom in South Africa didn't come because we just had leaders like Mandela. It came because we said we had enough of being having our dignity stolen from us. And we stood up and we we're prepared to take the risk of even dying to win our freedom. I'm asking you the question, turn it on its head. The just transition doesn't depend on the UN. And the UN is an intergovernmental organization. Our governments are bullied by corporate power. We know that. Why can't the unions decide this is what we are going to do, we are going to lead and we are going to drive that investment strategy. We are going to insist on our governments around prescribed assets on all pension funds to make sure that this green economy happens, that the transition happens. Because if you go to a coal miner today and say, coal is bad, and I've said that to many NGOs, it's a ridiculous debate. Unless you are able to say, well, what is the future? Not just the future of them, but the future of their children. But if you point out a future for their children that is much better than them becoming a coal miner, then they will embrace that. This is the whole thing about, about building mass mobilization. It's about how to get citizens to embrace the fact that power is in our own hands. It is our lives and the lives of our children that are at risk. And this is what we've got to do. And that's why we've got to unite with other parts of civil society. I see civil society well in the UN system, the majority of which are disconnected from their grassroots. And they think that clever discussions around a conference table is going to change the minds of those that have money power. It's never going to change their minds until we bring real power in the streets, real power through the unions, real power through NGOs and communities of, of farmers, of informal traders, of people in the squatter camps, of people in the rural areas that are suffering the consequences today. When I'm in Bangladesh, there are millions of people that are at risk today. It's not about tomorrow. It's not about 2030. This is the urgency we need. But in that urgency, we need to be demanding of those that cause the problem that they pay for this problem. 
And I think that's the thing that we need to make, bring the politics back into climate science. Because right now, they will defeat us on every occasion because you want to have a technical conversation with them. And they control the media, like you heard in this Congress hall. They control the dialogue. And that's why we have got to politicize this debate. It's about our future it's as citizens. It's about the future of 99% of humanity. It's about the future of our children that we are talking about. That's why I'm here. I'm an old guy, but I'm here because I'm worried about my children. Responses from the two of you to wind up because, um, you know, in a way I was going to finish up with a, with a, a, vo a, a message of optimism and Jay, who started off sounding very pessimistic, has obviously given us one path forward. Would you be happy to base some campaigns around uh, Jay's ideas, Brian? Uh, Jay, I, I agree with uh, almost everything you said, but when you say what is the trade union doing and why is it talking as though it's disempowered, I don't think so. I think, though, we have to recognize that there are some things that we can do and there are some things that we cannot do without the tools of government to, to accomplish them. Even in South Africa, COSATU understood the need to seize the instruments or the levers of power of government in order to get things done. That's what I mean when I say that, you know, governments must act. We want a sustainable future. We need sustainable industrial policies. We need a plan. Without a plan, a sustainable future will not happen. And without a plan for a sustainable future, without a plan for a just transition, we guarantee an unjust transition. Guaranteed. There is nothing about the casino economy that will answer these questions. There's, there, there's nothing there. They have no answers to these questions. Governments must act. We must remind them that they have to act in the interests of their citizens, with all their faults, with all the fact that their power has been corrupted by big money. We have to seize somehow the, the power that governments have to implement things like sustainable industrial policies and social programs that can deliver a just transition, because those are outside of the ability for us to achieve at the bargaining table. Those are things that have to be delivered with the tools of governments. And so I would just uh, say that, you know, we have to, to realize as trade unionists that there's no credibility in ignoring this problem, as you said. Uh, change is coming whether we like it or not. The choice is whether it will be a violent change, a violent scramble for resources such as water, energy, fertile land, with desperate last-minute survival measures that completely dismiss human rights, social progress, and everything we've fought for for the last century, or an orderly and just transition that respects and protects today's workers while creating new, decent work in sustainable industries for tomorrow. That's the choice, and we can only accomplish that by using all the power at our command, but also demanding that governments use all the power in theirs. Finally, Merlin, you've just arrived at Congress. What is going to be your message when you um, speak at the plenaries? Um, I think our overall message is to pick up on what Jay said, that if you are going to bring about the kinds of shifts in investment, which is essentially about economic opportunity, but also about mitigation, and if you're talking in the order of trillions, and I did not know that the ITUC sits on $30 trillion. Um, I paid attention earlier. So what you're talking about, if that were the case, is actually a, sh a small fraction of reallocation. But in who drives that reallocation is down to who makes the decisions about where workers' pension funds are invested. Is it invested in brown and dirty because the yields are seen as being higher? Or can we find ways to move investment towards where we know it is needed. And I think that's the message I will be, try to convey here. Great. Well, look, thank you, three of you, for being involved in this panel. Um, can you, I, can yeah, I sorry, just one, one last point. You know that pension funds, and this is a point that really we need to pay attention to, the fund managers are fooling us because they are saying that the yields are greater on fossil fuels when we know that many of those assets will be stranded assets that they won't be able to burn them. But they are controlling the narrative on that. So if we really had to have the facts at hand, they are promising your yield that can never be delivered. And that's the facts of the matter, and we need to bring those facts before the workers. On that note, we will wind it up, but thank you, all three of you, for a fantastic debate. Cheers.
wants to grab the best of your statements just down the barrel. You need to win for your next case, isn't it?